Good afternoon. A year ago, I made a decision that would change my life forever. After going to a conference on living on the margins, I decided to move from New York to San Francisco and live in an intentional Christian community called the Possibility Project, focused on reimagining the, the church in the Bay. At the time, I was very successful working off Wall Street and finance, and I knew I was going to take a leap of faith. I didn't know what was going to happen with my work, but I knew I had to be, respond to the call. And so I remember walking into the office of my CEO, who's, a, who's the type of person that you just kind of said yes to. And I remember telling him that I was going to make a move to San Francisco. And he said, you know what happens that we're actually going to open up an office in San Francisco, and we want you to direct it. And I couldn't believe my, what I heard, and I said yes. And with that, I set off on a three-week road trip from New York to San Francisco. Two weeks later, I was notified that the CEO had resigned after 17 years. And two days before I got here, I was notified that the company was experiencing severe cash flow issues and there would be no office in San Francisco. And so as I sat there in Asheville, Oregon, I had a moment to think, what am I going to do next? And I was given three options the next day. The first was go back to New York and pretend like the commitment I made never happened. The second was to stay in San Francisco but take a severe reduction in my salary as I wouldn't be directing an office anymore. Or the third was to take a layoff. I chose the layoff, and I chose to fully, faithfully involve myself into reimagining the church. My name is Brand Napoli. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at Palo Alto Church of the Nazarene. And for my entire life, I've attended the church. It's where I find my rest and my hope. For my entire career, I've served entrepreneurs, providing access to capital. And I'm here at the intersection of both those passions. As that entrepreneur in residence, I focus on trying to reimagine the church. And I focus in on also the passion of being in, in the church itself. For my entire career, I was able to expand in, in microfinance, all the way to actually presenting at Congress as well. Crossroads Church is located at the hub of innovation in Silicon Valley, and it's rooted in the American holiness movement uh, that was started by a heart strangely warm towards social action. And so I, as I settled into my new role as this entrepreneur residence, I gave myself that title, actually. <laughs> Um, I started to read about Christians' accounts that were social activists that took faith and work and started to think differently about it. And I started to think more in lines with what they're saying about how I've heard today as well that sacred work isn't just the work that's done in the church, but can be the work that's done outside the church as well. That the, it can be a part of this, this idea of moving towards shalom. That we're not just called to a job but that we're called to a vocation, and that we're called, and not just for our own ambitions, but for the greater good, to serve. And I also was convicted by Dorothy Day, who spoke out against the church in its absence of taking a stand of what work was becoming, of not taking a seat at the table, and therefore allowing individuals to become skeptic of not understanding why, why should I care about church if the church doesn't seem to care about what I do with my work, with the majority of my day where I spend it. And I was convicted by this. And as I thought about those in the marketplace, I realized that as a church we're supposed to love our neighbors, and that's where I started. And in Palo Alto, a lot of our neighbors are entrepreneurs. And so I looked at some trends in entrepreneurship in the church, and there's quite a few, and I'm going to point out two that stuck out to me and surprised me. You're not going to be able to read that, so I'm just going to tell you what it means. The first is a graph that I saw on an Inc. Magazine article that referenced the Kauffman Institute, or the foundation, and it referenced that since 78 to 2012, entrepreneurship in the States has actually declined by 44% across all industries. I think in the Bay, we live in an anomaly in many ways, and so we don't realize that. The second is a church that's been closed. 
and I saw in many, many different sources that between 4,000 and 7,000 churches in the United States close the doors every year. And so these, this begged the question, what would our communities look like without churches? And what would they look like without entrepreneurs? It sounds drastic, but in many communities, that is exactly what's happening. And could a faith and work ministry that's housed in a church actually help both of them become more fruitful? So, a little overwhelmed, the first place I started was looking at examples. I started to see if there was any examples in the United States that actually tried to address this issue. The first one, the Hack Temple, is actually located in San Francisco, and it's a Jewish temple that was converted into an accelerator. From my understanding of reading the website, I hadn't actually attend, haven't gone there, there's no affiliation with the religion at all. There's no spirit of the church there. And then I heard about this other place called Church and State, located in Salt Lake City. And so I got on a plane, and I actually went out there, and I visited with them. And it's a beautifully restored church that was sold. And they're adamant about saying that it's not affiliated with the church, that there's no spirit of the church either. And so I dug deeper, and I heard about this other place called Ocean's Accelerator. And I flew out there, and I met with the staff. And I was delightfully surprised that it was actually a model of faith and work coming together, investing in these entrepreneurs, and helping them to be what I call co-creators, but it wasn't housed in a church. And at the time, I was reading this book called Zero to One, and I do recommend it. And I'll read you this quote. What important truth do few people agree with you on? The best entrepreneurs know this. Every great business is built around a secret that's hidden from the outside. A great business is a conspiracy to change the world. And I was convicted by this. I felt, as a person of faith, I should have an answer. And so I sat for quite a while, and I thought. And I started to think that there is a significant opportunity for the church to house a faith and work model, something that's, that's different than what we see where work is going. I also believe that Innovation could be a form of faithfulness that I'll get more into it, but the goals of business in the church in many ways could be aligned. And I also started to believe that the spirit of discipleship could be captured in entrepreneurship. You see, the hypothesis I started to develop was that many of these churches we were probably closing the doors because they weren't responding to the needs and nature of the community that was changing around them. And I'm not a theologian, and so I'm not going to get into what they should change and what they shouldn't. But that's just what it is in many ways. And entrepreneurs, many of them, are not starting companies because the cost of starting a company is rising, and the benefits of working elsewhere are also rising. And so many entrepreneurs just go and they work for another company instead of starting their own. And so I started to feel like that these two trends and characteristics that seem to be mutually exclusive in, in the entrepreneurship and church were actually helping them become interdependent and symbiotic. I felt like both could actually offer something to each other in a way that wasn't being done. <laughs> and then it hit home, and I realized that I was manifesting that in my own life. The fact is, is that the Possibility Project was created because a church that congregation was dwindled down to nothing, it was sold. And those proceeds went into subsidizing housing to bring in individuals to come in and have time to actually think about how to be an entrepreneur and reimagine the church. And so, in fact, it was happening. And so then I put together this... <laughs> My PowerPoint skills haven't changed since high school. This, this graphic right here. And I started looking at, again, what the church, I believe, wanted was to respond to these needs in nature. Not to, not to lose its identity, but they do want to respond. They want to be useful. And entrepreneurs want to lower their, their, their costs, and they want to create benefits. The entrepreneurs haven't gone away. And I believe that if those two could come together, 
and I don't think I've coined this, but I would call it the entrepreneurial church, to have both in the same location. And then I added another arrow and a plus sign, and I started thinking the goals. And I hear over and over again, I'm not going to throw pastors completely under the bus, but I hear pastors always saying, we need to be faithful. And in, in the nonprofit sector that I've worked in a long time, I felt like it was sometimes hiding behind the mission of the nonprofit, a lot of other issues that need to be addressed. And I do believe that as a church, it absolutely needs to be faithful. And as a business, you have to be successful or else you go out of business. If you don't make a profit, it doesn't matter how good you are in many ways, right? But that misses, the, that misses the point. And I believe that Jesus calls us not to be successful and not to be faithful, but he calls us to be fruitful. He calls us to bear much fruit. He calls us in our, our character to have that fruit of the Spirit. And I believe that both camps are missing that and they both need it. So the how. Well, I'm here to highlight one model of how I feel like the church and entrepreneurs can actually be inspired to the next level in their fruitfulness. This is actually a picture of our fellowship hall that I quickly converted into the first stage of development, the first iteration of a co-working space. And this is the vision and mission that I started to develop. The vision. These churches are sacred places, and they provide a unique inspiration for entrepreneurs to co-create the innovation needed for shalom. There's a lot there. I don't have time to unpack it all, but I'll unpack the word shalom. And the mission, spiritual formation through discipling a community of entrepreneurs. I mean, too often shalom is just equivalent to peace. But this is the definition, I'm going to read it, that goes far beyond just peace. Shalom. The webbing together of God, humans, and all creation and justice, fulfillment and delight, is what the Hebrew prophets called shalom. In English, we call it peace, but it means far more than just peace of mind or ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight, a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts are fruitfully employed. Shalom, in other words, means the way things are supposed to be. I don't have a tattoo, and I'd love to get that, but it's too many words. <laughs> I call it model shalom. So model shalom has many benefits, and I have three benefactors here, and I know there's more, uh, I, I, but I just started with three. So the first is the entrepreneur. Why would an entrepreneur want to be involved in something like this? First, I believe... Ideally, the entrepreneur needs to be obviously called into wanting to be a co-creator for something like this. But beyond that, this would be a place that would have entrepreneurs, pastoral staff, and, and neighboring workers. And they call that uh, accelerated serendipity at these accelerators, where that water cooler effect, the ability to actually increase these times of actually innovation and, and being inspired. They would also want to be there because many times these churches could offer a lower cost, lower cost for them to actually be housed there than they would at traditional office space that can cost thousands of dollars. Many of these churches also are permitted and also have child care facilities. And I would love for a church to actually equip family values into a work structure as well. That that entrepreneur wouldn't have to decide between being a good entrepreneur that day or being a good father or a good mother, but could do both. These churches are many times offered or uh, available in in residential areas with parking. They're built for inspiration and peace. These are not typical factors found in offices. And it's also the fact that pastor staff are are equipped with actually caring for people. And in all my research of looking for co-working spaces and accelerators and incubators, they had the, the most amazing people, if you want, it's one in marketing and operations, but they had no one assigned to the actual health of the entrepreneur. And the, the stresses entrepreneurs face are just tremendous. And the last is, I believe churches are a network, a faith network, 
that can act as a nucleus to help entrepreneurs to become more fruitful, to help them with the things they need in order for their business to be successful. And so why would churches want to be a part of this? Well, the first is I think it would actually help them to fulfill their mission statement and their ministerial impact. See, entrepreneurs are those that can actually get things done with less and are problem solvers and can help to scale things and make best business practice and, and make the church actually have their first fruits in many ways. It also can provide another revenue stream into the church, whether they charge programmatic fees or ideally allow for the entrepreneur to, to be successful to the point where they pay them back later. And the third is I feel like it, it actually fulfills a great commission. You see, we're called to make disciples. And I believe that if an entrepreneur is invested in a discipleship program, that entrepreneur will run their company very similar to a pastor or run their church. And in fact, I really see the next wave of church planters being entrepreneurs. And the last are neighbors. You have to involve the neighbors or else they complain. <laughs> the neighbors would be able to benefit from seeing a faith and work model, seeing a different way of doing work. They'd also be able to receive the products and services of these entrepreneurs that many of which would be doing something of social impact. And they'd be able to work closer to home, ideally. My last two slides, I uh, went over time. but So what does the, the ideal church look like? Because the fact is, is I went back to my original question and said, this can't be just one church in Palo Alto. This has to be something that can be scaled and put out there in any community. The first step is inspiration. So you have to have buy-in from the pastor. You have to have buy-in, ideally even from the congregation, that there needs to be a faith and work model. That if that Dorothy Day saying doesn't resonate, then, then they're not even there at, at taking the first step. But once they're inspired to say, you know, God is good. God has a heart for justice. God actually wants us to do something about this in the marketplace. Then they're inspired. And the second is discovering. Actually investing in creating a space that allows entrepreneurs to work and to discover the gifts and talents and to create uh, the innovation needed for Shalom. The third is the formation of the entrepreneur themselves. Investing in the entrepreneur's character to make them realize that they are disciples and they are co-creators. And the last is commission. And this is the final step, but this is where the church would actually send them off. And, and as a missionary, you send off, and you don't just cut ties with that missionary. You continue to invest in that missionary, right? You continue to be accountable to that missionary as they go off. And the church should do the same. And the last is the ideal entrepreneur. The ideal entrepreneur is one that responds to the call that says, I want to be a co-creator in Shalom. It's one that wants to bring around the renewal of all things, that walks in the way expectedly, and listens for the longing, cultivates the sacred imagination, and leans into the leading. In conclusion, what if our conversation went from what our communities would look like without churches or without entrepreneurs to what they would look like if entrepreneurs and churches helped each other become more fruitful. Thank you. We Mass Media, Media Empowering Community.